great. Okay. Thank you guys for being here. Um, we're really excited for today's talk. So this is part of the Seagrass seminar series, which is an event of um, different seminars on seagrass topics that are leading up to the International Seagrass Biology Workshop, which will be in Annapolis, Maryland, in the US this August. And today we are really excited to have uh, Dr. Rich Unsworth talking about inspiring optimism for seagrass conservation. So Rich is an associate professor in marine ecology at Swansea University. And he has a great example of using research to solve real world problems, especially when it comes to seagrass conservation and restoration. Um, he has a really particular interest in understanding ecosystem service value for seagrass meadows and has really looked to try to figure out the role they play for supporting fisheries. He's also really getting into uh, experimenting with methods behind seagrass restoration um, and looking into how that, which has actually led to a role, major role, major role in driving the UK's first major seagrass restoration project. Um, but he doesn't just work in the UK, he's also worked in a lot of interdisciplinary research throughout Europe, Australia, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. So um, one of the great things that Rich has also done back in 2013, he actually helped uh, form Project Seagrass, which has had a lot of really inspirational um, impacts to the seagrass community globally. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Rich. Thank you so much for giving us a talk today. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jesse, and thank you uh, for, for having me and giving me the opportunity to, to speak today about um, some of the work that we've, we've been involved with for the, for the last, I guess, decade. And uh, Jesse asked me to sort of provide some of the, the, the background, the backstory to, to Project Seagrass and um, where we came from and sort of where we're, we're headed, I guess, with, with a lot of um, uh, uh, activity. So I'll try and uh, um, uh, give a bit of a uh, of that background, but I'm also going to then put it put over uh, our work in the context of some uh, um, uh, a paper that we, we published a number of years ago called the Global Challenges for Seagrass Conservation. I thought it'd be a nice way of it tying up uh, this presentation. So I guess uh, back in uh, 2003, I, was, I started doing a, a PhD working out in, uh, in Indonesia. And I was the, the, the lone geek involved with seagrass uh, research uh, at a research station and a sort of um, research and conservation philosophy that was based entirely around coral reef um, ecology. Um, lots of people studying a lot about the, the behavior of damselfish and, and cleaner ass, but not considering one of the major habitats that existed uh, in that region of, of, the, of the world. And I was kind of like this sort of um, stuck record going on about seagrass, but no one was really ever interested in that. And uh, um, my wife, uh, Leanne, was also working in uh, marine uh, um, conservation, but from a more socioeconomic perspective at the time. And um, she, she was really studying the, the value of, of coral reef systems, but everyone kept on telling her that it's not the coral reefs that are important, it's, it's, it's the seagrass. And uh, I was out in the seagrasses looking at the fish and seeing that no one was, was fishing on the reefs. They were all fishing in the seagrass. And it was those places that were, that were far more important and but you know it seemed um a long way from the um the conservation management philosophy to, to think about conserving seagrasses in uh, um in indonesia so fast forward to the end of the phd and uh moved over to to, to north queensland to to cairns and uh, i started working with a, a fantastic group there in the in the queensland government um and I discovered a whole sort of different way of thinking about uh, seagrasses. I'm sure the, uh, um, the North Queenslanders would, would argue that they don't look after the seagrasses nearly uh, as much as they, as they should, but uh, it seemed that they, they were leagues ahead of what I'd experienced um, in, uh, in Indonesia. And I was kind of, I was just taken aback by the resources they had, the, um, the, from 
both a scientific perspective and a um, a monetary perspective in, in that they were able to do surveys. They had maps of where all the seagrasses were. They knew what species lived in them. They knew where they were, what the parameters were that were driving their, their productivity. It was like, it was pretty amazing. And then I, I made a um, quite a, uh, a big decision with Leanne to, to move back to the UK. Um, when our kids start questioning why we did this, they're, they're a bit perplexed, but um, 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 we, we, we made that move anyway. And moved back to the UK where 2011, um, uh, the whole sort of um, excitement of all this great seagrass research and conservation work going on in uh, Australia came down to a big thump where Actually, no one really was was interested in seagrass in the UK. I spoke to various people in uh, uh, various levels of government who, who now swear they, they didn't say these things, but dismissed the um, importance of seagrass out of hand. And this phrase, it all died in the 1930s, so it wasn't really of much importance in the UK. Why bother? Um, that was the the, uh, the general philosophy, the general thinking that I came across in in the UK, and I was just I was just taken aback. I, I um, felt sort of anger building, really, that you know what's going on in in marine conservation in, in the UK in marine science. Now, why is no one studying it? Why is why don't we have the answers to this, this, and this? Um, and uh, I guess that that frustration. Um, led to the, the early days, the, the start of what, what then actually became um, Project Seagrass. Um, myself, um, uh, Leanne, Ben, Richard Lilly, um, we were all starting to, to get involved with uh, seagrass conservation and research in, in the UK. Um, at the time, uh, Richard and Ben were both doing uh, master's courses and getting really involved with looking at Ben was looking at the, the, the health of seagrasses around the UK and 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 RJ was was studying the value as a, a nursery habitat and he they kept on coming back to me saying I've been talking to lots of people about this and no one seems to know what seagrass is no one seems to even think it exists in the UK so it was just it was perplexing and um, the more we discussed, the more we, we kind of, um, I guess, um, uh, thought about this kind of scenario, we realized that, you know, okay, we're doing uh, interesting science work in a, in a university environment, but actually trying to make an impact with that is, is never really going to happen because um, universities are, are slow um, moving entities, they're um, uh, they're not particularly dynamic and uh, it's, it's a, you can't really change much very, very quickly. And we, we wanted to, to push forward conservation messages and actually be um, at the forefront of changing things. So uh, alongside our, our day jobs in uh, um, university, we set up Project Seagrass as a, uh, um, um, firstly, um, as a not-for-profit company because in those days we had to, to, to first prove ourselves as being uh, a not-for-profit entity and then we could apply for, for charitable status. So we uh, um, went through those steps and uh, eventually got ourselves uh, charitable status in uh, uh, England and Wales and then secondary we then got that in, in Scotland. But I guess that, that wouldn't have happened without um, a lot of support that came um, from around us, you know, there was, there was key individuals that supported us, um, key institutions. Um, I think the the CCAMS project at Swansea University um, was a, was a key part of uh, leveraging a lot of the uh, the activities that that we were able to to, to run. And then we 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 were able to secure an office thanks to, to Cardiff University, and then. Lots of little drabs of, uh, of funding came together where we can actually think, oh, you know, we, we can buy some tape measures to do Seagrass Watch. We can, we can, we can buy a couple of GoPro cameras. It was like fantastic. It was hu huge um, differences that we were, were able to, to make with just a, uh, a small pot of funding. And um, Sea Change is one of the, uh, um, the first uh, charity to, to support us. And then we got some money from 
um, awards for all. But you know, um, 500 pounds at a time, but that was that was pretty uh, significant for, for our development. Paper written by Carlos Joarte uh, a number of years ago described uh, seagrasses as being the the ugly duckling of of marine conservation, and that that sort of title sort of really um, stuck with the the sort of the location of uh, Project Seagrass in in, um, in Swansea. Um, Swansea is home to a, a famed poet and writer, uh, Dylan Thomas. And he he described um, um, Swansea as being the the graveyard of ambition, and uh, sort of stuck in its way, and uh, you know you, you're never going to get out. And it, there was a response to this uh, with some artists who actually wrote uh, the phrase "ambition is critical" into the uh, into the streets uh, uh, of Swansea. And I guess that's been the sort of uh, um, uh, a statement of intent, really, from Project Seagrass years ago, in and and thinking, come on, we, we we've got to, we've got to change these this scenario of, of seagrass being the ugly duckling. How can we how can we turn it into being um, this beautiful swan that it actually is um, um, in the minds of uh, the people of this planet? So uh, that's the, the, the I guess the um, the bigger picture that that we've been trying to to work towards is to try and. Uh, reframe uh, it as being the ugly duckling and and turn it into that uh, beautiful swan. But I, I guess paramount to what we've been doing as a uh, an organisation, it's been about it's about science at the heart of it and um, using evidence to actually transform conservation and communicate good science to, to the general public. And uh, I've recently been uh, made aware of a, of a journal, Conservation Evidence, uh, that's a sort of the way it's set up sort of, uh, I guess, um, mirrors a lot of the thinking that uh, um, Project Seagrass have within it. it. It's about trying to to use science to, to, to push forward conservation um, and um, show people the the real scientific value um, and evidence for why why we should um, um, invest in various actions to um, improve the state of our of our coastline. But a very big part of um, what uh, Project Seagrass is and uh, has developed from is. Um, the, the growth in the last decade of, of social media. Ten years ago, scientists weren't weren't communicating through social media. Um, ben and RJ trying to convince me that um, I should get involved with uh, a social media. It was like I think they they thought they were hitting against a brick wall because I'm like social. No, I'm not putting. I'm, I'm not tweeting. What's this all about? This is this this is this is for kids. I. Um, and uh, basically, I think one of the, the biggest things for Project Seagrass is, is that we were one of the, uh, the first sort of um, seagrass focused organizations that um, really wanted to um, get seagrass into social media. And that was very, very different um, back in 2003 when we, we formed. Um, if you look at the number of interactions on social media historically within uh, um, uh, on seagrass, then uh, um, you'll find very little, and 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 that that's where we um, from early days set ourselves apart from uh, from others. You know, there was lots of organisations doing um, uh, lots of amazing things about seagrass, but not communicating it um, and not sharing their 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 knowledge or their um, their activities with others, um, and and therefore it's difficult for for the general public to be inspired by it. And, and I guess that was where we sort of set ourselves out as being a little different in those days. You know, I think social media is, is old hat now, but back in 2003, that, that was, that was a, a novel moment, us tweeting all about seagrass. And I guess that, that philosophy of look, using communications, expanding to, to wider science uh, communication and um, uh, 
although we we primarily started off as a sort of a virtual organization we we quickly um, developed other activities we we started doing a lot of similar work to that others had been doing in other parts of, of the world you know getting out and um, talking to kids about uh, seagrass um, running events um, approaching different organizations and that has grown over time you know we recently had a, a collaboration with the uh, the outdoor swimming society that one of our team beth Ann, has has pushed and that's a, a fantastic group of people who are now engaged with with seagrass that previously actually wouldn't and, and that that's um the, the key part of science communication it's trying to think about you know not just talking about uh, your bit of science in a, a um an echo chamber but but reaching out to those different groups who who wouldn't actually engage with um um with with seagrass and and that's what we've, we've been trying to do um over the years trying to to work with with media um and uh, to to expand um the the impact of of what we've been doing and trying to get others to, to learn about seagrass so that actually they can be inspired and, and get involved themselves. And, and that's hopefully by, by taking this sort of broader science communication approach to our to our work, it's something that we're very much pushing forward and, and succeeding with. And I guess that takes me to the uh, um, next part of this talk really. And, and that's about the fact that yes, seagrass has been described as this, this ugly duckling and and it, and it creates a lot of challenges for conserving seagrass around the world. And back in um, 2019, we, we, we a group of us created a whole series of uh, challenges for uh, seagrass conservation at a, a global level that, that we, we felt needed to be um, dealt with to, to transform where, where we're at with, with, with seagrass um, globally. And I wanted to sort of put some go through go through these, these challenges, revisit them, and provide a sort of a context of where Project Seagrass um, has been uh, um, involved with um, trying to rise to these challenges and uh, how that's linking to, to other global and uh, initiatives around the world. And uh, we know that this is a lot of fantastic progress being made by um, organizations um, all around the world, but I guess the focus here is uh, today is, is um, me describing some of the, the input that Project Seagrass has been uh, um, involved with in trying to, to push forward those those challenges. So the first challenge we described is that we need to achieve societal recognition of seagrass importance, and. Uh, um, I think Bill Dennison uh, said um, maybe 20 years ago that, that uh, or so that um, there was 1 billion people living within, I don't know, 50 kilometers of a, of a seagrass meadow, but most of those people don't know that uh, seagrass even exists, let alone that it has any level of, of value. And that's quite a, um, a big uh, barrier to overcome. And I guess there's many ways to to look at um, improving um, uh, the interest and the um, the recognition of of seagrasses um, um, around the world. But in a um, um, a UK perspective, where Project Seagrass are based, um, there is increasing evidence that seagrasses are becoming more uh, readily recognised. Um, here's a, um, a graph that shows the, the level of relative interest as uh, defined by uh, Google um, um, trends um, as to the, to the word seagrass in a plant perspective, because you have to get rid of all the other um, uh, descriptions of, uh, of the word uh, seagrass. But actually, when you, when you look at that over time, there's very clear evidence that the um, the seagrasses are becoming increasingly recognized in in the uk and, and that's great and um i think from a, a project seagrass uh, perspective i think you know it's something that we're very very pleased at and um we've been at, at the heart of of, of pushing that uh, forward i remember talking to uh, to len mckenzie in seagrass watch and him describing the uh, the struggle they had in in writing the uh, um 
the world atlas of seagrasses in that there was no one willing to even just um, write a, uh, a chapter about seagrasses um, back in the uh, early 90s. And uh, then there was lots of progress made by uh, the team in um, Plymouth University, who then uh, um, one of them headed up off to uh, Emma Jackson, headed off to, to Australia, abandoned the growing interest in seagrass, <laughs> but, but took up a, a very different mantle in, uh, in Australia, which, which, which is great. And, but we've really we pushed this theme of, of uh, trying to um, get people to understand what seagrasses are and, um, and their, their value uh, around the UK. And, and to do that, as well as the, the, the sort of um, uh, our early days of just using Twitter, we've, we've branched out, we've, we've, we've approached different organisations, we've worked with different entities to both learn from them and work with them. Um, uh, Hendrix Gin have recently launched a, um, a gin inspired by, by seagrass, and that's leading to not just uh, uh, us working with them in, in the UK, but um, um, uh, a lot of organizations around the world also working with them to, to help communicate the, the value of seagrass. We've also been fortunate to, um, in the last few months, um, get the interest of the, of the band Coldplay in becoming our pa patrons. And that's, it's, that's another way that we can, we can use different, different markets to, to, to uh, um, I guess, communicate the value and importance of, of seagrass to, to people around the world. So everyone who goes to a, a Coldplay gig um, uh, will be persuaded to, to download an app about the band. And within that, there's a video about seagrass. So there's a, a group of people who had never um, experienced seagrass who are now um, perhaps learning something of it. And, that, and that's a, a fantastic thing that um, um, we're able to, to actually do. But scientific research is also at the heart of, of Project Seagrass and um, something that, that we've, we've um, been involved with and increasingly uh, involved with in, in the UK is looking at seagrass from different angles. And one of those is about birds. And although people for, for hundreds of years have looked at the value of uh, seagrass as being a, a fantastic habitat for feeding uh, birds that you can shoot and eat, there's been a, a lack of recognition for why other species might actually um, utilize seagrass. And, and that's something that um, uh, we're, we're realizing that there's, there's a huge uh, societal interest in, in birds. And actually those people need to, to appreciate that perhaps seagrass is a value to their, their um, key animals. Together with a, a student colleague last year, we, we, we wrote a, a sort of um, a review paper looking at how seagrasses might actually act as a, a really important source of food for um, a variety of different bird species. And although there are a number of papers dotted around the world, there's very little literature on it. And it's something that uh, we think there's a, there's a huge gap and it would be great to to spread that uh, interest around the world to, to think about how birds are supported by seagrasses in other parts of, of the planet. Um, there's, a, there's an army of people who go out probably every weekend counting birds in all, all parts of the world. And it'd be lovely to see them inspired by the value of, of seagrass in supporting their, their cherished animals. We've done some uh, initial work on this in, in the UK that's, that's showing that uh, some species such as the, uh, the Eurasian curlew, the shell duck, actually uh, um, seem to preferentially feed uh, and spend time um, in, uh, in seagrasses when we, we compare it against um, other habitats. And it's um, the first sort of uh, information like that from, from a UK context. There are bits from the Varden Say, some, some bits and pieces from the US and um, odd, odd bits in uh, Western Australia, but but limited sort of data around this. And um, I think it's a it's a great thing that people can get out and um, add to this this data with. Great for student projects. If anyone in the audience has uh, uh, students to supervise, although 
we're, we're very much pushing um, uh, for increased societal recognition of uh, seagrasses. Um, I, I guess um, from a scientific perspective in, in, in the UK, um, we, we, we're doing very well. We're, we're getting um, governments, um, we're getting uh, media organizations involved. And part of that is, is um, um, media linking to, to scientific output and, uh, and doing a, a very good job at that. But, you know, we we're quite fortunate in, in, uh, in the UK to, to have, um, I guess, relatively wealthy uh, academic institutes who can support a lot of uh, activity and enable the, the message of science to, to get out. And um, uh, my colleague, uh, Benjamin Jones, has, has been looking at how um, academic articles uh, Around the uh, the world are being covered um, by different types of media using something called the the altimetric scoring. And what it's showing is that there are a lot of seagrass articles that are, are being picked up by the the world's media, and um, societal recognition about seagrasses is, is is being pushed forward. But as you can see from this map, um, that most of the globe is not involved in that. And although seagrasses cover uh, uh, most of the planet, they, um, um, their value isn't being picked up. Um, science from different parts of the world isn't being picked up by, by, the, the, by the world's media. And uh, that needs to change. And we, we, we need to, to think about how uh, different parts of the world can, uh, that aren't um, um, able to to get the the world's media involved with um, communicating the value of seagrass, how that can actually happen. Um, but you know, there's there's uh, certainly um, areas of optimism around the world where where seagrasses are clearly being well communicated to to the media and uh, increasing recognition with it. But um, in many parts of the world, that isn't happening. But I just wanted to put a, a, a big up here to, to one sort of gold star at, at the moment that, that deserves recognition because um, um, myself, uh, Jesse, uh, Mike just received a, uh, an e email from uh, Maria Portoglau um, about a successful um, um, presentation that herself and uh, the team from uh, um, um, the Sri Lankan government um, uh, with, with a lot of passionate uh, input from um, Susantha, um, um, they've actually presented the case of, of seagrass having its first um, World Seagrass Day um, that's recognised by the United Nations. So they presented that to the United Nations uh, earlier this week, and there's a lot of uh, positive interest around that. So, you know, uh, um, there's um, there's a, a, a great kind of a movement of uh, organisations, governments. Um, pushing forward societal recognition of, of seagrass and, and we, we need to, to continue to support that and uh, it's great to see that places like Sri Lanka are, uh, are pushing forward with it and, and taking it to the United Nations a level that actually seagrass has never been discussed at. Um, um, I'd be surprised if, if there is one mention of the word seagrass in the, uh, the transcripts of all debates that ever happened in the, in the United Nations so I think uh, uh, a big well done to to Sri Lanka for for getting it to, to that level, but we need to we need to keep going with that. The second um, global challenge for for seagrasses, we're about obtaining and maintaining information on status and um, condition, and that's about knowing where seagrasses are, um, trying to think uh, where they they could be trying to understand uh, the, the condition they're in. And one of the, the, the key lessons that I learned from working in the Great Barrier Reef was that they knew where the seagrasses were and they were, they were able to, to model their distribution and, um, and with that, think about their, their management. And in the UK, um, it's taken, taken us 11 years to, to catch up with, with some of that. And, and we're, we're now uh, modeling the potential uh, distribution of, of seagrasses uh, around our coastline. Um, but we still don't really know um, where where seagrasses are. Uh, we've got lots of 
sort of scant uh, information about historical distributions um, and, uh, and current distributions, but they've never been properly mapped. And um, you have to kind of hypothesize a lot on um, um, where it is now and, and uh, how abundant it previously, um, previously was. But Project Seagrass, we're um, heading up a, an initiative uh, with a company called CGI to try and um, think about how we can uh, use technology to um, map the seagrasses uh, around the UK. Um, the, the image on the right shows the, the, the perfect uh, example of, of using uh, drone footage to, to map seagrass in lovely clear waters. But the reality is that uh, it's never that easy when you've got turbid waters around the UK. So we're, um, we're bringing different partners together to, to, to solve problems, whether that be um, looking at hydrographic information to, to improve uh, how we, we use remote sensing data or the, the tools of uh, uh, company Ocean Infinity who uh, remake, make remote vehicles for, for mapping the seabed. It's about bringing different ex expertise together. And it's nice to, to report that there's lots of global initiatives now happening that uh, are bringing together global data sets on seagrass. They've got a long way to go, and uh, there's lots of difficulties that are inherent in trying to, to do that. Um, but there's a, a program being led by the by Marine Geo that's um, trying to, to deal with some of the, the difficulties, and that's linking to lots of these international programs like the, the Global Ocean Observing System. So progress is being made on, on mapping the world's uh, seagrasses at both, both local and global scales. There's some countries that have got exceptional data. Um, there's some countries like ourselves that are uh, sort of on a pathway to, to at least getting there. But there's still many countries that uh, don't have good uh, seagrass data. And uh, um, so that challenge is, is very much still on for, for many of those countries around the world. The third challenge was that we need to identify threatening activities at local scales to better target um, management um, action. And unfortunately, we know that um, seagrasses around the world remain um, heavily uh, at risk and are threatened by various different um, um, parameters. There's a great um, modeling study that, that looked at um, global maps of, uh, of pressure um, relative to trajectories of change in, in, in seagrass around the world. And uh, we can see that um, pollutants, shipping, extreme temperature events are, are negatively um, impacting um, uh, seagrasses. But they don't really tell us the, the detail at the, at the local level. And um, when we begin to dig into the, um, the pressures at actual local levels, then we begin to see slightly different uh, stories. and 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 you can actually begin to think about what are the actions that people can take on a, on a local basis to, um, um, to change the trajectory of, of their seagrass um, meadows. Um, in, in Project Seagrass, we've been looking at some of the data that's coming out of our Seagrass Spotter um, program, data that is publicly available that people can access. And if others want to use that data to write publications to um, uh, uh, in any, uh, way they're, um, they're entitled to, to use that data and we encourage people to, to, to access it um, um, as much as they want. And um, what we're seeing is that many of the impacts on seagrasses around the world are things such as anchoring, mooring, aquaculture, seaweed farming, things that are specific disturbances at, at local scales um, that actually have potential um, opportunities to be uh, to be managed, and uh, one of those um, um, activities, um, anchoring and mooring damage, is a particular um, problem in in the UK, and it's something that that we've been been looking at, both in terms of using um, advanced mooring systems, um, which are quite expensive, but also in terms of trying to, to work with stakeholders to, to improve how they, um, um, uh, they undertake um, their, their boating activity around seagrass. But something that uh, in that work that, that uh, leapt out at us was that not all solutions are expensive and, and complex. And 
um, from doing lots of surveys around um, um, mooring um, um, areas in, in seagrass, what we've actually realized is that most moorings um, in these areas are very much follow the, um, uh, the traditional uh, use of chains, which drag on seagrass and um, create damage. But actually, if you, you change that to, to rope, then what we actually find is that they're, they're far less, less damaging to the, to the seagrass. And in some, some instances, that, that damage is all, almost a non-existent. So I guess what I'm saying here is, is that looking at um, stresses and uh, threats to seagrass, although it's important to look at bigger scale things, it's also important to look at the local um, um, scale impacts to think about what measures can be taken to uh, locally manage and make small steps to actually improve the health of, of local seagrasses um, in your locations. The fourth challenge we came across was balancing the needs of people and planet. And uh, something that um, our CEO, um, Richard Lilly, RJ, has been very passionate about over the years, talking about how the sustainable development goals relate to, to seagrass. And you can go through the, the 17 um, um, sustainable development goals and, uh, and think about how they um, relate to seagrass. 16 of them actually clearly relate to seagrass. Um, it's kind of quite interesting when you start digging into the targets and examining it. And uh, uh, one of our team, Leanne's actually been working with it with a group in, in, um, in France who are, uh, who are examining uh, SDGs uh, across all of our natural systems. And um, there's, a, there's a huge um, um, value here for, for thinking about how we can use the sustainable development goals to push forward action for uh, conservation of, uh, of the natural environment and particularly seagrass. Because we, we tend to, to think about when, um, people and planet in the, in, in the context of ecosystem services, things that people, governments, businesses, uh, stakeholders don't understand what the hell is uh, an ecosystem service. But actually kids are taught about sustainable development goals in, in school. Um, in many, many countries. And um, people in their work life come across the, the sustainable development goals because they're pushed forward by, uh, by uh, business interests. And um, we're increasingly realizing that I think this is a great way of communicating the value uh, of seagrasses um, um, to people. And uh, um, uh, something that we're pushing forward in, in Project Seagrass is is uh, working with uh, local fishermen in, in Wales to, to see how we can get them involved with restoration and conservation. And um, communicating seagrass in the context of uh, the sustainable development goals makes sense to people uh, um, like Mark, who I'm, I'm working with in, in West Wales, but others um, in the, uh, um, um, the world around him as well. And I think it's a, it's, it's a great uh, thing that I think the, the seagrass conservation world needs to pick up on. We also need to understand um, how valuable seagrasses are for um, supporting people on a, on a daily basis. And uh, um, one of the challenges uh, uh, within that paper was that we need more data on fishery activity in seagrasses which led to the creation of something called the Indo-Pacific Seagrass Network, which is led by uh, uh, Lena um, Nordland. And um, that, that study has examined, um, amongst uh, many other things um, um, in the Indo-Pacific, the, the abundance of, of sea cucumbers in, um, in seagrasses. And uh, what we're beginning to show is that um, where we have well-managed seagrasses, it's not surprising that actually they have an abundance of, of animal life that feed people on a daily basis. But parts of the Philippines, um, parts of Thailand where actually seagrasses are, are very poorly managed, um, we find that um, that abundance is, is no longer present. And uh, we need to use this sort of data to, to uh, challenge these, the conservation action that's um, being undertaken for, for seagrasses. 
The fifth challenge for global conservation of seagrasses is about generating scientific research that supports conservation actions. And I think when you, you look at seagrass um, research uh, globally, then there's a lot of big, big sort of uh, statements that are, are made um, about uh, the value, um, the drivers, um, the stresses of, of seagrasses. But when you actually tend to, to dig into this at much uh, more local scales, you realize that, that we still are only scratching the, the surface of our knowledge about seagrasses. Even when you think about the value of seagrasses as a nursery habitat, um, you think, okay, the data's there. Well, it's not. Uh, it's there at broader perspectives, but actually huge parts of the world we have no data for, key species we have no data for, there are many questions, many knowledge gaps that um, are still need to be filled um, in the seagrass uh, research um, field. And uh, a key way that Project Seagrass have been involved with, with uh, um, fulfilling some of these, these gaps in a, in a UK perspective is that when we started down a road of uh, looking at seagrass restoration, we needed to uh, think about the different populations of seagrass that are present. And could we actually collect seeds from one location to translocate them to, to another location? And how's that gonna uh, impact the uh, genetic population? So um, um, our CEO, Richard Lilly, and some colleagues at um, uh, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh have been taking on this mantle and trying to uh, to understand the, the different populations that exist. And uh, here's a, uh, uh, a PCA that, that shows some of the different populations that are popping out. And there's lots of things that uh, you broadly expect, but then we have some uh, outliers that come from nowhere. And, uh, and uh, with, with all scientific research, it's almost like you, you, um, you try and answer one question, but it uh, opens 10 further questions. And uh, I think that's what we've done with ourselves here, uh, where we've, we've uh, it's great, we've got a figure like this, but um, I don't, I'm not sure what we've, uh, what we've achieved, but it shows how uh, um, um, there are so many gaps in uh, um, seagrass knowledge um, uh, that are needed to be filled to, to underpin uh, um, um, good conservation. And the last challenge is about conservation action in an era of climate change. Um, that groups, individuals, um, governments, organizations need to take on the, the mantra of, of actually acting rather than just um, talking. And I guess within Project Seagrass, um, you know, we've been immensely inspired by the, the activities of uh, of um, Bob Orth and uh, his wider team over the last decades in, in, in putting seagrass restoration on a, a positive uh, trajectory um, to restoring vast areas of seagrass. And uh, th before the, uh, the, the start of this, this call, uh, Jesse and I were talking a bit about that and how uh, one of my, my team is, is uh, visiting um, VIMS um, uh, next week to, to to understand the uh, the successes of, of what's uh, happened in uh, Chesapeake Bay. But um, it, it's also that we need to understand the failures um, because uh, the world has made a lot of uh, restoration failures, me included, and um, we need to learn from them as much as we learn from the, the successes. And um, it's great to be inspired by their work and, and others around the world have been you know, following a lot of the great work that's been going on in the Netherlands and, um, and Sweden and then Denmark and, and learning from all those activities. And uh, um, Project Seagrass, we're, we're, we're fighting our own uh, little battles to try and uh, restore seagrass, but it's, it's great being able to, to learn from these, these incredible examples. But something that's very new to us at Project Seagrass is the, the idea of trying to, to grow seagrass. Some people have been trying to grow seagrass for, for decades and have got very good at it. Some people have uh, tried for decades and, and are still struggling. And that's because historically no one shares uh, information and understanding on how to grow seagrass. It's sort of one of these things that's been uh, off the radar from a, a research perspective. And 
um, together with the uh, University of uh, Groningen and um, a deacon and uh, Central Queensland University. We've reached out to all sorts of partners around the world to, to get them involved in, in setting up a, a global seagrass nursery network um, with the aim of trying to, to share knowledge about how, how we grow seagrass in a nursery um, and how we, we can use that for, for conservation. That's something that um, is vital to uh, uh, making this, this work <coughs> because once you start talking to these different organizations that have been growing seagrass, you realize that half of them are men making exactly the same mistakes um, and the other half are about to make the same mistake. So um, there's, there's lots to learn in that, uh, um, uh, that sphere from, from talking, from uh, exchanging knowledge and, uh, uh, and something that um, we're pushing forward with the development of our own uh, seagrass nursery in, in West Wales. Um, which we, we hope to be inspired by a lot of the, uh, the knowledge that's been developed um, elsewhere and, and, and share what we, we learn. Um, but um, we do thankfully have some seagrass growing in a tank and it's, it's getting there and it even flowered. Um, so uh, um, we're very excited by that. But as you can see that, that, that uh, it's covered in epiphytes and that's what everyone uh, uh, tells you is the, is the biggest battle. Finally, I wanted to uh, um, share a slide that's in Project Seagrass we've been talking about for, for, for some while. And that's the concept of uh, when, when will seagrass around the world um, uh, hit a, a positive uh, trajectory? And the reality is that, that we don't really know because we don't know how much seagrass there is on the planet. We don't know really how um, rapidly it's declining or maybe recovering. There's some estimates in, in um, that it could be um, recovering, but um, uh, I personally uh, doubt that because our data is, is so skewed towards um, 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 particular initiatives and uh, particular institutes and particular countries that uh, we miss large areas of the world. But I think that as a as a community we need we need to push forward to 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 get our uh global seagrass um ecosystems on a a positive tra trajectory and something that that has inspired us in, in the uk is something called the uh, biodiversity net gain where um there's all sorts of management actions particularly around terrestrial uh, ecosystems when um infrastructure developments happen where uh you actually think about the um, the biodiversity present, um, how much could be damaged, and um, by any any level of infrastructure development, and and how you can begin to to manage that, uh, mitigate, offset, and um, and ultimately improve the uh, uh, the biodiversity present, not just um, offset it. Um, and in the in the uh, uh, the the basis of creating um, infrastructure developments is that you're improving biodiversity rather than um, um, keeping the, uh, um, the current uh, status. And we think that um, the, the kind of global net gain of seagrass is something that, that as a community we need to work towards achieving. And it's something that as a community we need to think about uh, when we can begin to even understand whether we're, what trajectory we're on. Um, and I guess these these challenges that I've talked about today really bring together those those uh, this kind of whole theme of thinking about um, how we can set the world on a on a pathway to um, a net gain of seagrass and when that might actually realistically happen. Um, um, what point in the next century are we going to get to that point? And uh, on that. Um, Here's my last slide that uh, just uh, shows some of the, the, the quirky levels of um, communication that uh, Project Seagrass have, have gone to over the years to, to get people uh, engaged with, with seagrass. And uh, um, I think that um, underpinning that everything that I've talked about today and, um, is, is the fact that if you're gonna uh, change the, uh, the view of seagrass, then you need to get people excited by it. You need to get people laughing at it. You need to get people uh, wanting to see some charisma in it. And uh, just describing it as some slimy green plant ain't gonna get you there. And you need to, to, to think about uh, how, how people can be excited by it. 
and uh, thank you for, for listening to me. Thank you very much, Rich. This is very good. Um, yeah, thanks. Everybody, thank you for joining me and thank you, Rich, for an awesome talk. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. So if you want to um, sort of just put the question in the chat or feel free to unmute and, and ask away, um, this is a great time to get a chance to talk to Rich. Any questions? Well, I can, I can lead us off. People are sort of thinking about questions. Um, so what I know in my area, when I'm trying to get people excited about seagrass or trying to connect them about seagrass, I typically take, take like a fisheries perspective. Like, do you like to, you know, but when sustainable, I've never thought to use the sustainable development goal. So which ones do you think sort of have the biggest resonance of people that kind of help most people kind of connect to seagrasses? I think talking about fisheries, um, it's sort of uh, doesn't really connect with people because people don't really understand what fisheries are. They just see it as a either they see it in, in, in the perspective of some uh, cute old guy in a fluffy woolly jumper mending his nets, or they see it as in terms of an industrial uh, uh, decimating of our oceans. Um, and actually, it's about food. That, that seagrasses actually help supply food. They put they put food on people's plates and and. Um, some some work with, that um, uh, Richard Lilly was involved with in uh, um, in Greece was about trying to to follow how um, food that was ending up on people's plates um, was actually linked to seagrass. It's it's no good just saying actually they they to provide a fisheries habitat for species A, B, and C because a lot of people um, beyond the echo chamber don't really know what fish is. Like this, it's white fish. So, oh, that's what that's a, that you know what, what, what species is, is which it doesn't matter to them but actually the supply of food is important okay yes repackaging it's a great way to think about it any other questions bill thanks yeah um great job by the way richard um so i think one of the things that if we look historically uh it's what what happened in denmark when when the wasting disease occurred there had been this uh, mantra that seagrass is provided at the base of the food web for the North Sea. And then the seagrass wasting disease came along and the fisheries did not collapse. So there was this, and that's when they started talking about detritus food web and all that. So in that case, we, we kind of lost a lot of momentum in seagrasses uh, for seagrass conservation back, this is you know almost a hundred years ago. So, we need a definitely need a more nuanced approach, but but in addition to the to the fisheries, uh, the the habitat thing, and I like your idea of going with the birds. I think that's a great a great way to go. But we I think we also have to talk about coastal erosion and protection with sea level rise. I think with climate and and the fact that with climate change, ocean acidification, there are winners and losers. The corals are losers, but seagrasses could be winners there. So so I think we've. We've got to be, we got to watch out and not overstate like they did in Denmark in the 19 or um, 20s and, and early 30s, overstate the importance of seagrass, but but make sure that we, 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 we get the right message so that we don't get shown up again like the wasting disease. I think that's, that's, that's fair, fair point, uh, Bill. But I think there's also with 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 that wasting disease. I think I I, I actually begin to wonder whether um, we don't really understand that, and the, the data that underpinned a lot of that um, um, is is not clear. And it, did actually the wasting disease truly um, uh, decimate the seagrasses of northern Europe, and uh, or was it two hundred years of industrial development that did it? Um, and you know, it, it's the, 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 when you dig into the data, although lots of um, uh, um, well-off gentlemen of the, the 1920s wrote sort of eloquent letters about um, um, uh, the wasting disease, when you actually dig into the, what they did, they, they visited a couple of sites uh, um, ar around uh, the coast and said that the seagrass had all disappeared. And I, 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 I'm... Um, it's it's a sort of controversial view, but I don't buy the idea that um, actually the wasting disease decimated seagrass in in uh, northern Europe. I think it did in North America, but um, but I think 
And there's some, I've got, uh, uh, Colleen Birch has a couple students working on Labyrinthla now trying to reevaluate the, the temperature relationship and stuff. So I think that Blaston disease is still, a, you know, it's a hundred year old mystery that we still need to resolve. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, without, without a doubt, I agree. But I, I was I was attributing the, the waste of disease as as a the example of building too much into the conservation value of or in the case of the fisheries values of the seagrass ecosystems and we we need to be a little more um, we we need to do a better job of of communicating what's going on with the with the seagrass uh, role in the coastal ocean. Sure, I I completely agree. There's a comment in the chat that, that somebody has a, um, uh, they actually developed a cardboard game involving questions about seagrass facts. So that's pretty great. Okay. And then another question, um, as restoration of seagrass is not easy, not always successful, do we have any standard method to make restoration cost effective and successful? I'd love to be able to, to say that uh, we know everything about restoration and uh, um, I don't know whether Jesse, you were looking up to the gods then, or or what. But uh, um, I, I I think that uh, there's so much to know still about seagrass restoration, and uh, there are many um, projects that uh, uh, still fail. And you know, we, we we've just um, at great expense built um, really detailed. Um, models on where seagrass should uh, grow around the North Wales coast and and um, two or three of the sites where we thought were actually perfect they've been inundated by huge levels of sediment that were just not in our model and uh, we thought okay actually that's perfect but um, um, even our marker boys and everything are just inundated by sediment so you know there's a lot we still know but there's but you know there's, there's a lot we do know as well you know about how if, if we get the site right if we get environmental conditions right and um that various methods will work and um but but you've got to you've, you've got to test your methods locally i think that's the that's the key and, and try and understand the, the the sort of nuances of your local environment to be able to to make it make it work because i don't think there is a a uh, silver bullet at the moment for for how to make that work. And I do want to put in a little bit of a plug for the WSA website. We are um, partnering with members of the global seagrass community, including the folks of the C Grass Group that Rich mentioned in part of his talk. And they have this excellent community of practice um, group who are putting together lots of different methods, along with some of the marine geo standardized methods that will be out there um, for folks to kind of see what would work. In, in your system um, to see what's a good starting point of what to try. Um, and I think it's like Rich mentioned, we really need to focus on what works and what doesn't, because um, that can be really frustrating to hear that somebody has the exact same problem as you. I wish I had known. Um, any other questions? No? Well, we are coming up to the end of the hour, so. I just want to thank Rich again for taking the time to give us an awesome talk with some really great examples. Um, and it's really good to see things moving in a positive direction as far as communicating the importance of seagrass. That's really great. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and let you guys go and hopefully we'll see many of you at ISVW. Um, yep. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Rich.